Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Circle Up and Get Real, where by now you know we talk about things that matter with people who matter. And today, the person who matters is my dear friend, Tommy Spaulding. Tommy, we met many years ago in um, California when we were both at Extreme Leadership, and I happened to be sitting next to you on the stage. Do you remember that when we had that picture? Oh, yeah. And Steve Farber put that on. Farber. What a beauty he is. Oh my gosh. And you have a history with him. Well, we both kind of do, but you have a long history with him. Beautiful. Um, there was something about you, Tommy, that I just felt drawn to that I can't really explain in words, but it was something I just wanted to sit by you. It was just kind of funny. You know, it's this, this um, heart centered stuff that I know you're doing that, that I've been doing. And um, I'm just really grateful that you're here to have this conversation with me today grateful too. And the feeling is mutual. And I think what you picked up on is I think authentic, genuine, heart-led, heartfelt people have a vibe, mm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, then, and that vibe is there that people want to be around that vibe and they want to connect. And I felt the same way, Jody, when I met you years ago. So cool. So Tommy is the founder and president of Tommy Spaulding Companies, which is a leadership development, speaking, training, team building organization based in Denver, Colorado. Tommy is an author. Um, he's written several books and he does retreats on leadership. Um, we could go on and on about your bio. I will put your bio in uh, the show notes here, but there's something about you, Tommy, that you've always had that, I think, even before you knew it, maybe even before you articulated that heart led leadership characteristic. Is that true for you? Um, I didn't know how to put my finger on it, but at, at a young age, when I was like, 14, 15 years old, I went to my first like leadership camp. It was called RILA, Rotary Youth Leadership Academy. Oh, mm -hmm. And um, it changed me, Jody. It was mm -hmm. amazing. I, I was a struggling high school kid. I had dyslexia, ADHD, ADD, OCD. I had it all. Mm -hmm. I had so many learning challenges. I spent my junior year, junior high school and high school in the resource room. Mm -hmm. And all my friends were going to college in, in good colleges. And I was barely going to a community college. That, that was my journey mm -hmm. academically. Um, but this camp just got me turned on to the work that we do now. Like mm -hmm. I'm And Tom France was the closing speaker of this leadership camp, Ryla. And he was an HVAC guy, this beautiful human being. And he's talking about leadership, like in a way that I never heard before. I was like, I was like barely 15 years old. I thought leaders had wealth. Leaders had parents that were not hairdressers, like my grandparents or school teacher, like my grand, my, my parents, they, they, they had country clubs and they had wealth and they had positional authority. And like, what's a, you know, blue collar, you know, guy like me doing leadership. And he, Tom France says there's three types of people in the whole world. Three types of people in the whole world. In the whole world, billions of people, three types of people. You're either going to be a leader, or you're going to be a follower, or you're going to be a critic. Mm. Three types of people, leader, follower, critic. And then he said something that changed my life. He said to the group, I like 200 high school kids, which one are you going to be? Which one are you going to be? And Jody, at 15 years old, I've never been on an airplane. I never left New York. I'd never traveled. We didn't have a lot of money. But to think that, Every day we get to choose not to be a critic, choose not to be a follower and choose to be a leader. Mm -hmm. We choose to be a leader. And so I decided then right there at 15, I wanted to be a leader. I don't know what that meant, but I wanted to be one. And then after 25 years of doing what you do, re researching this stuff and teaching this stuff. And, you know, I dedicated my life to learning about what leadership's about. I, I think that Tom France was right. There mm -hmm. are to people in the whole world. They're leaders, followers, and critics. But to dive deeper, if you choose to be a leader, I believe, and you believe, Jody, that there's two types of leaders in the whole world. There's, if, if you choose to be a leader, you're going to be one of two types of leaders. You're going to be a servant leader, what I call a heart-led leader, or heartfelt leader, as you call it. It's someone that wakes up every morning and truly puts others before themselves. Right? They're truly a servant leader. They put their wives, their husbands, their partners, their children, their, their employees, their investors, their, their clients, their friends, their family. They put others before themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the other type is a self-serving leader. And it doesn't mean you're a jerk or an yeah. ass. It just means you're a self-serving leader. It means like you wake up every morning and I got to take care of myself first. Mm -hmm. I come first 
And when I'm my needs are met, then I'll take care of other people. And those are the two types. And I'm going to say something, Jody, that's going to probably rock your, your listening audience. But I've been doing this stuff now for 25 years. I got three books on this subject. So this is my life research. Right. 90% of all the leaders in the world. 90% of all the leaders. So Tom France, if you choose not to be a critic, you choose not to be a follower, and you choose to be a leader, 90% of all the leaders in the world are self-serving leaders. Wow. That means most of the leaders... Most of the teachers, doctors, lawyers, nurses, I mean, authors, athletes, whatever job you have in the world, 90% of all our leaders in the world are self-serving leaders. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make them ass, doesn't make them all mad. Doesn't mean 90% of the world are asses or 90% of the world are jerks. It just means that 90% of the of leaders are self-serving. Mm -hmm. That means servant leadership. That means to be a heart-led leader is really, really hard that 10% of the group in the world that truly lead with mission first, people first, and um, passion over profits, like the, it, it, they're rare. Yeah. And the reason why you and I are, in a, are, are, are authors and, and coaches is we wanna, we wanna flip that. We want 90% of the world to be servant leaders and 10% to be asses and self-serving leaders. But, <laughs> but, but here's where we're at, right. you know, 2024, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Are you noticing, Tommy, in your 25 year career, any yep. shifts? Like, are you seeing anything move at all? Or is it still that percentage? Still that percentage. We have mm. a lot of work to do. Okay. A lot of work to do. And it's not that hard. It's just really being mindful and really taking an inventory of your soul and who you are and how you want your legacy to be and how you want to look at life and how you look at money and how you look at your, your profession and how you look at yourself. Mm -hmm. But I believe our greatest legacy is the influence on the lives that we have on other people. And if we could motivate people to wake up every morning to think about what difference can I make in other people's lives? How could I help serve other people? Mm -hmm. we, 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 you have such more of a richer uh, life. Yeah. If we interviewed all the 10% of hard led leaders, we would see they had great families, great marriages, great relationship with their kids, great legacies, great companies, great organizations. They are happy people, great wealth. They have everything. Yeah. But uh, the, the one thing they have in common is they wake up every day and they put others mm -hmm. before themselves. And that is really hard to do. Yeah. And when, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as you're saying this about the law of diffusion of innovations, mm. Everett Rogers um, talked about this bell curve of innovators to laggards. I don't know if you're familiar with that bell curve. Mm. I've talked about it a lot on this podcast, but if you think of a bell curve right in the middle is 50% on mm. the left side of the bell curve, the first little tiny little sliver is two and a half percent of the population who are the innovators the ones who come up with the ideas. The next 13 and a half percent are the early adopters mm. who get the idea and then take it. The next 34% are the early majority. Then the next 34% on the right side now of the curve are the late majority and 16% are the laggards who will never change their mind no matter what. So if you and I are having this conversation about the 10% of leaders who are not self-serving, who are servant leaders, and you kind of overlay it with this law of diffusion of innovations, I, I always look at the early adopters, 13.5% of a population, as being my target. I used to believe I needed to wake up the laggards and the late majority, and I was beating my head against the wall for so long in my career. They're fully baked. They're a done deal. Yeah, right? Yeah. There's no moving them. Right. So if, we can, if, if what I've been doing lately is just moving over to the people who already have ears to hear what I'm talking about, and then we together will influence the early majority, which will tip the system. And so the the words that you're you're using in your books and your retreats and your speeches and all those things are, I'm guessing, are there for the people who have ears to hear what you're saying, not the people who don't. Yeah, I like that. I, I never heard of that bell curve. That's good stuff. So then for me, that changed the way I thought my work was in the world because it's so much easier to speak and be with people who you feel you're already in community with in yeah. some way, you 
you know, it's why we were connected in the first place, why we went to extreme leadership, why we're friends with Steve Barber. All of those people who were there are in that group of early adopters, probably. And that, it, I don't know about you, but it, it has me put my shoulders down and go, oh, thank you. I'm with my people. Mm -hmm. I become somebody different in the listening of my people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to reconnect with you because you have been such a great and steady and constant drumbeat for heart-led leaders. Mm. And even though it's hard, even though it maybe doesn't feel like the percentages are shifting, mm -hmm. they are. They are for the ones. They are yeah. for the people who are listening. Yeah. I need to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You you have done so many things in your life, given the beginning that you just described to us, ADHD, OCD, all of those things, and how everybody else was going to college, and you said you struggled, but you've done a lot, Tommy. Oh my gosh, you were the youngest president of Up With People. Mm. You know, Up With People, I, I probably told you this when we talked the last time, I hosted a couple of yals who were in up with people many, 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 many years ago when I was really young in my career. And I learned about up with people from the inside. Yeah. And it's such an amazing organization. It was when I was aware of it back then, um, probably when you were the president, to be yeah. honest. Oh. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that experience for you, um, wh where it went? Yeah. And how it influenced you? Yeah. Up with people is the biggest influence of my entire life in a positive and a negative way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But let's talk about the positive first. Yeah. That's that's more important. But you know, my parents, my mom never went to college. Um, her parents were hairdressers. My mom eventually went to college when I graduated high school and became a teacher. But my dad was a teacher. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't really travel, and I didn't really you know see the world. Mm -hmm. So when up with people came to my high school, and we hosted you know students that lived in Europe. I I'd never been to Europe before, right? And um, I went to see the Up With People show and it was just so moving. And, and those that never heard about the people, it's it's kind of like the United Nations mm -hmm. of young people that travel around the world and live in host families and did community service and put on this musical show called the Up With People show. And they did four halftime shows, the Super Bowl. That It was massive in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And they had a message of loving all people. And so it wasn't it wasn't a religious organization. People always thought it was a religious one. No, it was it was the opposite. It was all religions: Jews, Christian, Muslims, atheists, communists, capitalists, socialists, um, gay, straight, rich, poor, black, white. I mean, every walk of life, mm -hmm. all relig all religion, all companies, all all um, organizations, all co countries, and young people coming together. And the message was about loving all people. It just hit my heart in such an amazing way. I spent 20 years of my life with that organization, traveling to 84 countries and living with you know a few thousand host families. And I learned how to love all people. And um, do I have a religious affiliation? Yes. Do I have a political affiliation? Yes. Do I have a sexual orientation affiliation? Yes. I have all those things as we all do, but I love all people mm -hmm. and how I learned that was through up with people. And so I started out as a 17 year old kid, you know, volunteering and traveling the world, you know, giving my heart to serving the world. And I kind of worked my way up. And before you know it, I turned uh, 35 years old. And when the founder of the organization, Blanton Belk, who is just a legend of a human being to change the world, when he retired after running it for 50 years, he chose me to be his successor. And, um, become the CEO and president of that organization at 35 years old, which was such an honor. <laughs> and now that I'm 54 years old, I realized, God, I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I, I wish I could take that job today. I would have done it such a better job. Mm -hmm. um, but I leading the organization up with people was, was also a blessing to be able to give back to the organization that changed my life. But the part that broke my heart, and we've talked about this before, Jody, was the, the founder the most charismatic, the, the visionary of this incredible worldwide organization. When I got behind the curtain, you know, like the Wizard of Oz, when I got mm -hmm. behind the curtain and see who the wizard really was, he was a narcissist. Mm. He was absolutely a self-serving leader. Mm. And 
the, the, the leaders that really ran that organization that, that were his lieutenants all feared him and there wasn't love and there was a lot of ego. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Adam Grant wrote this great book, uh, years ago. I love this book by Adam Grant called, uh, give and take. And he said, the world's full of givers and takers. And he really kind of broke it out of three types of people. There's givers and then there's takers but he said the most uh, most dangerous group of people are the third group, and they're called the posers. Mm -hmm. so they're the one that poses as givers, but they're really takers. Mm -hmm. See, we know what a taker looks like. You just stay away from them. They're takers. Mm -hmm. But posers are dangerous because they pose as givers, but they're really takers. And uh, the, plant, the, the founder of Up of People was absolutely a poser and uh, broke my heart. It really broke my heart because I looked up to him like a father mm -hmm. and he and he had so many other great qualities of leadership and visionary and no one in the world could have done what he put together. I mean, up with people changed the world. It was unbelievable what th that movement did, but dedicating my life to it and then finding out the founder was, was kind of a poser. It really kind of broke my heart, but it also inspired me mm -hmm. when I left up with people is I never want anyone ever have to work for a guy like that. Mm -hmm. It's awful. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to, I want, I want to start coaching leaders how to be servant leaders and how to put love in their heart and to wake up every morning and be humble and genuine, authentic, and leave from a place of love, not fear, and and um, leave, leave from humility, not arrogance. And you know, just it motivated me to kind of do what we do. So right. uh, you know, Bland Belk's still alive. He's like in his late nineties, and I wish him well. And he was a good husband. He was a good father and, and, and he was a good human being. But as far as a leader, mm. never want to be like that guy. Yeah. You know, when you mentioned that, it, I think about what's happening in our world, the world we live in right now, not just politically. There's a lot of organizations that it seems to me, if we're going to use the term narcissist, that's a, can be a clinical diagnosis, like, you know, diagnosis. Yeah. And then there are people who act as narcissists because they're so in fear of, um, I don't know, of not being found out to be um, who they say they are, like you said, a poser. And I I don't know, it feels like there's a whole lot of fear that's sort of getting exposed in the world. And maybe that's because of the work you're doing, the work we're doing, because people are starting to see that there is that third area, that poser. And we're not okay with posers. I mean, I, I we can talk a lot about politics. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the work you're doing, Tommy. That's the thing that when they recognize that there's another place to go, another way to think of leadership than the way they think it's been. Um, yeah. It's easy to say, well, I guess if you're going to be in big business, then you have to be a jerk. Yeah. No, but we don't have as many examples of conscious leadership or conscious capitalism as yeah. I wish we did. Um, but I would like to believe that the work we're both doing is exposing more of that, sure. even though it's not run by fear. Yeah. Jody, um, I'm going to be 54, uh, 55 this next year. And if you ask me this question, I'm going to ask the question I want you to ask me. And it was basically like, if you had one thing that you, after 30 years of, of like studying this stuff of leadership, what, if you had to put your finger on what's the one thing that you've learned? I've actually just recently figured it out and I'm starting to really come to terms of what, it, what, what, what I'm really feeling about leadership. And it's this, you can't love and serve other people. You can't be a heart led leader or a heartfelt leader. You can't be a servant leader. You can't wake up every day and serve others before yourself unless you love yourself. Mm. And what I'm learning is where, where I was wrong is I would say that the world's full of self-serving leaders. 90% of the world are, you know, they're self-serving leaders. They're, they're the narcissistic asses. They're the, they're the self-serving leaders. They're, they're bad people. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was completely wrong. It was actually Liz Wiseman who wrote the book Multipliers, who's an amazing friend and an incredible thought leader. And I shared this with her, you know, that there's 90% of people that are just these bad leaders. And he said, she said, no, Tommy. There's 90% of the people in the world that are broken leaders. They're broken people and broken people do bad things. And that's what it got me really thinking. When you wake up, all the heart led leaders that I know, the servant leaders, the ones that are leading organizations where they truly put others 
uh, before them in a genuine way. And they put their spouses and their children and their family and their friends. They're truly heart-led leaders. They all have one thing in common. They all love themselves in terms of who they are, mm -hmm. right? Like they, they, they love who they are, their story, and they're comfortable in their own skin. And because they are, Jody, they don't need the attention, the yeah. fame, the recognition, the corner office, the stock option. They, they don't need it's, but the broken people, the, the servant leaders that are out there running organizations, they need the attention. They need the recognition. They need, they need, they need, because they have this kind of this hole in their heart. And I think the work that we need to be doing is working with leaders and teach them how to truly love who they are. And I know this, Jody, because I'm one of those people. Mm. And I think I'm just really coming into terms of finally loving who I am as a person, my flaws, my weaknesses, like who I am. And because I truly now who I who love that person, I'm truly able to give my heart an authentic, genuine way. And I think that's the work that we need to do as coaches is to identify leaders and get them to truly be comfortable in their own skin so that they can start giving love and giving uh, attention and giving recognition and just pointing the finger to others because they don't need the finger point yeah. themselves. So good. So I started in June, I started a, a group called Enlightened Leadership Lab with mm. my co-host, Chris Angel, who I'd love you to meet sometime. And in the Enlightened Leadership Lab, we hold space for emergent conversations mm. because we're, it's a lab. We get to practice these things where I, I'm supposed to know how to do this if I'm a leader. I'm supposed to know how to, you know, run a company or do a thing. Mm -hmm. But it's for the very reason you've just described. We've never had a space to be able to be authentic and to own our yeah warts and our faults and all of that because we've been in fear and i think what happens to use um eckhart tolle's distinction in ego he talks about ego being bigger than and smaller than what we were created to be mm -hmm. so if we go back to what you and i were created to be in the image and likeness of a creator anything that's bigger than that mm -hmm. like oh, i'm all that i need the corner office i need all this stuff or smaller than that, oh, no, no, not me, I'm not worthy, Right, right. has right. the same effect on who we were created to be, that being that we can learn to love. Yeah. yeah. And that's in the middle of ego, I, I think. And I'm working on that too. Uh, mm -hmm. I call that the is space. What is? I'm created to be something. Mm -hmm. And if I think I'm smaller or bigger, I'm pushing on what actually is. Mm-hmm. And so to not allow my ego to get the better of me, you know, in a big way or a small way is a, is a journey. And I can't, no, I was going to say, I can't, I choose not to do that by myself. Mm -hmm. I want to do that with people. I want to do life with people who see me, understand me, get me, support me, witness me. And I want to do the same for them. And in that space of community, I think that's where things are going to start shifting. Yeah. Amen. Mm. And that's why I will be coming to one of your retreats in 2024. I'm going to put that out there right now. Oh, um, right I want to be in the space. I want to be in your space. I want to be in your space as a presenter, as a facilitator, because I've only seen you as a peer. I want to see you as in your glory. I want to be part of your. Be honored to have you. Yeah. I think one of the most beautiful um, secret sauces is when you can have high confidence and who you are and what you do, but then also high humility. Mm. And you and I were talking a little bit before the you jumped on the, the webinar, just, you know, the more wealth we have, the more success we have, the more money we have, the more positional authority we have, the more, you know, job title we have. We, we As we grow in our careers, we get more of this, uh, ironically and unfortunately, the more arrogant we become. It's a direct correlation, Jody. The more money, the more wealth, the more success, the more fame, the more positional authority, the more job, you know, importance you have, the more arrogant you become. Mm -hmm. And that is total counterintuitive what heart leadership is all about. And those 10% of leaders that that we that we know that are these amazing heart led leaders, the more fame, the more wealth, the more success, the more positional authority, the more job title they they get the more humble they become. Mm. And that is just oh, beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's just nothing more beautiful 
when you have someone that's so confident in who they are, that God gives them these great gifts and they're just, they lean into those gifts and they just kick ass at what they do. Mm-hmm. And then it comes from the deep, deep, humble place that, um, you know, that they're there to serve other people and that these gifts were given to them and they're, they're just stewards of those gifts. I love hanging out with those types of people. Yeah, I think that's why you and I connected the first time we met. And I think that's why we're committed to that kind of work. Mm-hmm. Because if the world was filled of high confidence, high talented, high like, humble leaders, we would have a whole different world, wouldn't we? We would. <laughs> a whole different world. Is that correlated then in your experience with what um, Jim Collins called level five leaders? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Absolutely. And level there were leaders are totally heart led leaders. They're the leaders that are humble, that are genuine, that are authentic, that are real, that are vulnerable, that are highly confident. And there are so few of them in his research and what, like, as you said, 10%. So we have to find these people and put them together because yeah. trouble shared is trouble halved yeah. and joy shared is joy multiplied. Yeah. And so if we can find a way to build those kinds of communities. I, I know you're doing that in your retreats. You're, you're introducing people to each other who might not know each other in any other way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think you're doing that. I mean, I know you're doing that, Tommy. And I want to challenge you to start seeing that number grow. Let's see if we can make that 10% grow. Yes, I like that. I really needed to hear that. Thank you for challenging me because I guess I've been working with so many leaders that are narcissist and Mm -hmm. self-serving and cheating on their spouses and Mm -hmm. just not being good to their employees. And and I've just just been around a lot of self-serving leaders in in, in my industry, in our work, and and maybe I'm clouded. And um, I need to start realizing that that number 10%, it could be 15% by next year. Like let's, let's look for that because look- they don't know you're there. They yep. they're under the radar because they think they need to be like the narcissist yep. because they're the loudest voices. Right. But the still small voice is the voice that needs to be heard. And if we can find a place for that still small voice to multiply, I think that's where we're going to start seeing that number. Get yeah. Bigger. I love it. I love it. Thank you for that. Yeah. You well, I, I'm looking around at what I would used to call coincidences. Um, oh, isn't it a coincidence that I just reached out to you and asked if you would have this conversation? It's no coincidence because it needs to happen. Things yeah. need to happen in a way that um, has our world yeah. wake up to the space people haven't had. Mm. And you offer that space so well. And What will happen when the people start shedding themselves from you who are the narcissists and who are the people who think they need you, but they're faking it Mm. so that you have more room for the people who are authentic and just don't know you are out there for them. Mm. Mm. You don't need to convince. We don't need to convince Tommy. We don't need to convince. I love that from Steve Farber. He said, I'm not in the convincing business. I'm in the cultivating business. Mm. And Steve, who does um, extreme leadership work, um, he's our mutual friend. Um, Boy, when we can just start sprinkling those seeds and watch where they come up, it's so much easier than having to convince. Yeah, yeah. He's a perfect example of someone who I believe um, is the real deal, but someone that sees greatness in other people and, 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 and is so committed to helping other people get there. Yeah. He, he saw me as just an, I met him when I was running up with people and and one that said to me, you know, you got a gift and coached me and loved me and opened doors. I mean, he's just such a beautiful human being and people don't realize this. He's one hell of a musician. Oh yeah. Play the guitar. Like I'm talking like he could be in any rock band in the world and get it and get away with it. (laughs) Well, he moved from California to Missouri and just picked up where he left off. I think he's actually changing the the world of music in Kansas City. Yeah, yeah, he's a special human being. Yeah, he yeah. sure is. So you were his GTY project, weren't you? I was. He wrote a book called Greater Than Yourself, which is really an amazing book. And it was really about, you know, when you're a coach, you want your you want your athletes to be more successful than you are. Mm. When you're a violin teacher, you want your your pupil to be a better violinist than you are. When you're a teacher, like you want your pupils to be smarter than you are. Like like people that get into the industry of, of coaching, teaching, and, and lifting people more successful than you. It's everywhere. 
But when you get in the business world, as he says, it just gets all thrown out like, no, I'll help you, but you're not going to climb the ladder of, you know, over me, you know, right. you know, and he just says, why does the golden rule, you know, go away with business and it doesn't need to. And he wrote this book called, uh, you know, greater than yourself about business leaders need to pick someone in their field, in their company, in their organization, in their community and help pick that person up and make them greater than yourself. Like that's mm -hmm. your greatest legacy. Mm -hmm. You can make someone greater than who you are. Right. And Steve Farber was a Wall Street Journal best-selling author that wrote two, at that time, two great Wall Street Journal books. And there's only one type of book that's better than a Wall Street Journal. And that's a New York Times best-selling book. Mm -hmm. That means the book sells, you know, crazy amount of copies. Right. Well, when Steve met me, I, I not only did I ne never written a book before, but I probably never read a book before. Yeah. Like I was totally dyslexic and, and Steve's, you got a book in you, you got a great book in you. And I believe you have a New York times bestselling book in you. And he helped me introduce me to my agent, Michael Palga. I and mean, he, everything came into place. And sure enough, you know, I, I got three yeah. best -selling books and two of them are New York times bestsellers. Oh, and, good. and, and, and you asked Steve what his most proudest moment is when his mentee, you know, surpassed him, right. you know, with books. And how many people in the world actually think that way? Yeah. Like Steve Farber, like truly happy for other people being more successful than them. And by the way, um, Steve Farber is incredibly successful because of that. Because mm -hmm. he lives a life of lift. And I'm just one of his G2A projects. He's probably had dozens of them. He He wants to live a life of helping other people be more successful than him. And that's why he's got this great marriage. Yeah. Incredible kids and a blended family, like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. and he's got joy and happiness. He's got everything everyone wants because he's a giver. Yeah, tr so true. If you don't know Steve, look him up. I'll put his information also in the notes. Tommy, will you talk about your newest book? Um, you have a new book that came out just a couple of years ago, a year ago, um, The Gift of Influence, Creating yeah. Life-Changing and Lasting Impact in Your Everyday Interactions. Oh, God. So, a book that, you know, when you write a book, you don't just write the book, the book writes you, it mm -hmm. just books change you. And I remember like years ago, there's a guy named John Gordon, who's an author, great author for great books. He was uh, at one of my leadership programs I run. And um, he was talking to the audience and said, oh, the average person influences 80,000 people in their life. I heard that on the radio the other day. He said, that's a lot of people. And he went on to something else because he's got He's got ADD just like me. He went on to something. <laughs> but Jody, as soon as I heard that the average human being influences 80,000 people in their life, wow, it just hit me. The average human being influences 80,000 people in their life. Wow. How the hell did you come up with that number? Yeah. So I actually did the research. I was like, wow. There was some research done that, um, that you take 80,000 people and you divide that by the average life expectancy of, of a human being, which is 77 years, and you divide that by 365 days, mm. you get 2.8 people. So research shows that the average human being, when they wake up every morning, and by the time they go to bed every night, that the average, the average human being influences or meets 2.8 new people a day. Okay. You go to Starbucks, you got yeah. an Uber driver, you got a flight attendant, you got a new employee, you got a new neighbor, you got a new customer. You're like you, you meet 2.8, call three people. Mm -hmm. Every day you meet three people, 2.8 people a day. Multiply that by 365 days a year. Multiply that by 77 years of your life. You meet 80,000 people in your life. Wow. And I just became obsessed with that. Like, you know, as authors do, like it just, it just took me over. Like, oh my God. Every day, God puts three people in my life. I'm going to meet. And 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 you have a positive influence in these people. Or maybe you have a negative influence. Maybe you're a total jerk to the Starbucks priest because it was late or cold. Or like every day we have an opportunity to have a positive influence in these three people or a negative influence. So I started thinking a lot about that. And, and I started thinking how cool that would be. Like how cool would it be at the end of our life? Like right before we die yeah. and go to heaven that we got to meet like literally meet and say goodbye to all 80,000 people that wow. we met. Like how cool would that be? Or how scary that would be. Like, yeah. <laughs> and so where would they fit? 
Mm-hmm. And I started thinking about that. And where do, where does 80,000 people fit? Well, hell, they fit in football stadiums, right? Like, so I started researching, like, there's actually 37 stadiums in the United States of America that have exactly 80,000 seats. Wow. Like, Bill Field, New University of Notre Dame, University of South Carolina, like all these. There's actually international stadiums, Wilmington, 80,000 seats, Beijing Olympic Park, where the opening ceremonies were in, were in Beijing, 80,000 seats. So there are, there are thousands of stadiums in the world, right? Pick your stadium at the end of your life, like right before you're about to die, like literally right before you're about to die, we all go to the 50 yard line or half field or midfield. We all walk into our favorite stadium and we open our eyes and every single human being we've met since Mm -hmm. we were little kids, little babies, little kindergartners, middle school, high school, college, like the whole life, all 80,000 people are in the stadium, all there to say goodbye to you. Wow. I wrote a book on this and the question in the book is the question I raise now is what's the sound of that stadium? Every single person you've met that you've had an influence on positive or negatively, what's the sound of the stadium? Hmm. Are they giving you a stand ovation, just pounding and just going that shit crazy? Jody, you changed my life. You sat next to me at this conference. You poured into me. You love me. You listen to me. Like you were the guy, you were the girl, like 80,000 people screaming at the top of their lungs. You were, you were amazing. Or is the hmm. stadium booing? Hmm. Are they booing, cursing your name because you've just been a dick your whole life, hmm. right? Or a jerk, or self-serving, or self selfless, right? Um, or is, worse, is the is the stadium silent hmm. because we've been staring at this our whole life, down at it, and not looking up hmm. the person in front of you? And so I've been really studying the this whole thing about influence and that influence is a gift. That's why the book is called the gift of influence to be a positive influence in the lives of others. Like, and and sometimes you could be both like you talk about Blanton Belk, the founder of other people. He was absolutely the most positive influence in my life, changed my life, changed the world with open people. And then he was also the most negative influence in my life. Cause he was such a self-serving leader. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I want people to, to have stadiums of 80,000 people screaming and yelling and, and chanting their name and thanking them because they were heart led leaders and they were influenced. So they, they want to influence the lives of others. And I think we all have an opportunity to have those types of relationships in our lives. And, and the choice is ours when we wake up every morning is how are we going to treat the three point, the 2.8 people that we meet every day? So good. Pretty powerful. Oh, so good, Tommy. Oh my gosh. You are so inspiring. Um, I love who I am in your space. Mm. And and I think that's maybe what you and I can both do for the world. We can help people feel that by being a presence mm-hmm. in their lives so that they can feel the way I feel when I'm in, even virtually in your space. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. Thanks. So uh, how would somebody get a hold of you, Tommy? What's the best way if they heard something today that they'd like more information about? Yeah, uh, my website's Tommy. Uh, spalding.com and i have a u in it s-p-a-u-l-d-i-n-g mm-hmm. but my email is tommy at tommy so just send me an email easy enough so if you get it if you feel inspired send tommy an email he's yeah. great at responding you guys and i think anybody who fits into that 10 percent of people who are looking for your people you're looking for a place to be the kind of leader you know you are as a heart-led leader Come into Tommy's space and just be part of his newsletter. Get get involved. Um, you've got other opportunities coming up, Tommy. What are some of your retreats that you're coming uh, that are coming yeah, up? In 2024? I'm doing six Hartley retreats in 2024, and I would I mean just love these. We have 25 leaders at each of these retreats, and for three days, two nights, we just dive deep. Like, how do you really become a heart led leader? Like, how do you really do it? And how do you really love yourself enough to, 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 to give your life to loving and serving others? Mm-hmm. And, and not just for business, but also relationships with your, your, your kids, your marriages and so forth. Like Jill and I, we have three kids and we always say to each other and we giggle, our kids have to live with each other. They have to live with us. Our yeah. three children have yeah. to live with us <laughs> yeah. until, they're, until they're 18. Yeah. It's called the law. <laughs> but after that, they don't. Mm-hmm. We have to earn that. Mm-hmm. You want to have a, a a relationship with your children, even into adults, you have to earn that. And so these retreats that we do really teach you, how do you be that type of parent? How do you be mm-hmm. that type of leader? How do you be that type of friend? 
to, to, to be a total servant leader, to be that part of that 10% we talked about. And I, I just love these retreats because when you put 25 amazing, authentic, genuine, humble, real people that want to grow and learn, it's, it's just magical. So good. So good. Tommy, thank you for the honor of your presence with me today. It I is an honor. You, You're easy to love. Oh, it, it, I love who we are together too. This is this is what's possible in the world when we get real, everybody. Real, radical, energized, authentic, learning focused. This is the platform that this podcast is built on. And so if you've heard anything that you resonate with today, please reach out to Tommy. And Tommy, thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are in the world. Thanks. I'm I'm grateful. Happy and holidays, everybody. And as always, everybody, go get real. We'll talk again. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Stop recording.